My name is uh, Richard Rogers. Christopher Sanchez. Uh, I'm Lena. My passions, where my money goes generally, is not building a system, it's, it's my family and fishing. Anytime we have people visit, for me to be able to share what I've grown up doing in this area is a blessing. I made sure I had smoked salmon, ended up catching some crab last week that I intentionally cracked and saved for, the, for this event. And our trick is you take a triscuit or a cracker, put some cream cheese on it, throw some smoked salmon on it, and then my mom's jalapeno jelly. You understand we're hiring you for this, but as you work and grow into being part of the Shinyata family, the goal is for us to fit you into what you're best at. Well, when I started, I started out as a technician. I shipped products, I built products. A lot of my responsibilities now has to do with R&D, working one-on-one -on -one directly with Kaylin. I kind of do a little bit of everything. I think Cassandra's one of the best representations of that for Shinyata. How many hats do you wear? Seven, eight, nine? I do as much as I can, and if I can, that's when we go to Richard. <laughs> I don't know that I have one, oh, okay. but I call myself brand and marketing manager. It takes a while at Chunia to kind of find your place because it's a company full of people that have been here for a long time. The need that I noticed uh, when I arrived was really to support Grant and Richard. Help facilitate anything I can do for Kalen to make his life easier because he's, without Kalen, Chunia is really not Chunia. I'm Robert Harley, editor of the Absolute Sound magazine, and I'm here with Kalen. Kaylin Gabriel, founder of Chunyata Research in the Chunyata factory, and wanted to ask Kaylin a few questions and uh, talk about his history and background and uh, some of the current products. So what did you do before you started Chunyata, and how did that prepare you for making audio products and the specialized audio products that you do? Well, in my life prior to Chunyata Research, I worked in the networking industry uh, with a company making high-speed internet and what was called fiber channel at the time. So high-speed fiber uh, data transmission. Um, I've been in that industry for decades in a variety of roles. And I think I was in my late uh, 40s, I believe, going into 50s. And as was the case during that time, many of those technology companies were going out of business. The industry was downsizing, and so I was one of the particularly high-paid individuals that was quite old. Um, and they drew the line, and I was one of the guys that had to go. That's when I decided I'm going to turn my avocation or my hobby into something that perhaps I could do as a business. So I had always been an audiophile going back to my early 20s. I was in the military and when you're in the military you were either into drugs, cameras, or audio. <laughs> and so I, I was very much into the audio part. This is our original patent of a power cord that would reduce noise with ferroelectric substance. This is a design for a power supply which I called absolute immunity. So even though we make power conditioners and we make power cables, this power supply design actually makes power cables and power conditioners irrelevant because it isolates the power supply from the power line and it does it by having two banks and switches back and forth in time with the uh, AC signal. So it's actually blocking power during one half wave of the AC and pulling from storage and then it switches and charges one bank while pulling power from the other bank. So this is actually a, a patent for how to do a power conditioner that in real time corrects for the harmonic distortion. We never produced a product based on this because we're able to do it passively which means the reliability of it is superior. Like so many of us, I had spent tens of thousands to nearly hundred thousand dollars on an audio system. And I actually was quite frustrated at um, trying to improve the system to get it to sound more like real music or live music. So I used a lot of the equipment that I used in the network industry. I had access to some spectrum analyzers and, and uh, data analyzers. So what I identified, I, I wasn't looking specifically for 
something related to power, I was just trying to see, well, what are the things that are causing this? And so I settled on that much of it had to do with the power supply itself and the power feeding the power supplies. Um, so when I when I was let go in the networking industry and it was very difficult to get an equivalent position, I decided, well, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, produce a product uh, related to what I had found. This is our first reference room. This room is a room within a room. So, Robert, you understand how these are built. The floor floats and the walls are all suspended and the roof is independent of the building. So the entire room is isolated from the building. It's faceted, so there's no parallel walls. It's a live-end, dead-end room. So this end is um, absorbent and then we have diffusion throughout the back and, and the sides. So when you enter here, please don't step on the boundary. This is a double gasketed room. So this room, this door seals the room and the second one seals it. And then you'll see that the roof actually slopes and is faceted. And then this is the air conditioning system. This was designed so it's baffled, so that it's like a transmission line, so that the resonances in the room don't go into the air conditioning system and then get kicked back or act as a resonant port to the room. This is historically where I would do all the development room. And as you can see, it's a fairly small room. So it's not a great room for doing demonstrations with groups of people. So we actually built a, a bigger reference room primarily when we bring distributors or VIPs or groups of people. But uh, all of the research I always do in this room. This is the control room. So this is normally where all the electronics is. And like I said, the speaker cables will go through the wall. This electrical panel, all of the circuits are dedicated lines. And you'll notice that the length of the wires are identical. So my sister is a master electrician. She's the one that did the wiring. And then this panel is fed by its own transformer on the building downstairs, which I'll point out to you. You come from a whole family of electricians. Yeah, my grandfather was an electrician who installed, um, putting in uh, oil refinery and gas refinery plants, managed all of the electrical installations. So I made the products primarily for myself but I had a really good dealer who was a friend in Washington State. And I was telling him about it and he said, well, why don't you bring one of those over and let me try it? And so I brought the prototype over and let him listen to it. And he said, you know, this is really good, but you know what's really hot right now? And remember, this was about 1997, 98. And he said, what's interesting right now is power cords, and believe it or not, power cords actually make a, make a difference. I said, you're kidding, mm. just a power cord? <laughs> and he said, yeah. And I was telling him about mm. the ferroelectric substance and how I had a, a patent on it. And he said, you know what? Would it be possible to put that in a power cord? And I, and I thought about it for a minute and I said, oh no, man, that, that would be really hard because um, you would have to try to put it in tubes and then you would have to try to have a conductor in the middle of that. And then if you, first of all, it'd be heavy. And then second of all, if you tried to bend the cord, it would be mm. very difficult because it would be the equivalent of compressed sand, you know, it, that it would be very difficult to move it. So, so I, I said, no, I don't, I don't think so. But uh, as time went on, I thought about it and I found some substances that were actually crystalline in nature and very lightweight and they actually uh, were smooth which allowed them to move freely amongst themselves so it wouldn't lock up. So our first products were actually power cords that had the ferroelectric substance built into them. And so this dealer friend, uh, he had many VIP customers and he let some of them try them and um, they caught on 
and uh, I was building them on my countertop at home <laughs> with my with my wife. She, she took the orders, I built the products, and that's pretty much how we got started. Mm -hmm. And then as we moved along, um, uh, I needed to make more of them than I could make, and so I actually brought my mother in, and she helped me make the cables. <laughs> and so we really truly started as a, a family business on a kitchen countertop. Mm. And now how many square feet is your factory and how many employees do you have? Our factory right now is over 20,000 square feet and I'm, I'm not sure how many, 25, 30? Mm -hmm. 32. 30, 30, 30. <laughs> see, see, you, you, can, you can tell I'm not, you can tell I'm not. All of the original employees, we have, I'm very proud that all of the original employees, which includes Chris, which is our production manager, and Grant, I hired them uh, probably in uh, 1999, within six months of each other. That was over 20 years ago, and they're still with me. When I first started, I actually started when Kalen wasn't even in manufacturing. He wanted to just do uh, design. And so he hired, contracted a company out of Wyoming to do the manufacturing. So that's where I started with the company. He asked if I'd be interested in coming out here to start the manufacturing process, so I did. Drove all of our products from Wyoming up to here in a U-Haul in January, uh, brought it up here, moved it in, and that's when we, he bought a house in Kingston and we were working out of a three-car garage. This was the production floor. It was just this room, it's only this room. As you can tell, we've obviously expanded. But when you say that, this room, you... It was this room, just so right here. Right at this wall. It was the production floor when we first got this building 12 years ago, somewhere around there. And so I have, so we just set up different workstations. So in here, as of today, is primarily just the cable uh, aspect of what we do. So I have interconnect stations here, here, and here. And this is where all the signal cables get built, any digital signals, analog signals, all of them are at this station. Along the perimeter over here are all power cable stations. So I got a power cable station here, here, yeah. on the opposite side of that, and then two more on that side because power cables are obviously probably what we do the most of. And then as we come through here and as we expand it, so originally, as I said, this was the only room, so this was my original hydro station. But since we have grown, we've outgrown this as a hydro station, so now all my power cable conditioner stuff is built on this side of the wall. As you can tell, power conditioners take up a lot of space. So we've kind of outgrown ourselves over here and expanded over here. So every time we develop a product, we go through a series, goes through a series of test changes, sometimes improvements, things added, things taken out. So once we have a final production run, we build a model for the unit. And so this is where we have our model stage as a reference. Every tech <laughs> is, is required to build off the notes that are typed up. So we have build books for each product that we do. And they are used at their station for reference. But these are visual aids. You know, sometimes I refer to uh, something internally that they're not familiar with. So these things here are what we build so that we have our visual aids for anything that we have current. And then I have a a palette of a lot of them over there that we have then archived. So here is an Everest coffin and so the units that have these coffins they're they vary and so this one obviously is the top of the line coffin inside this coffin and I can show you back there there's chambers inside of here six changer six chambers in inside of this unit and obviously there's a lot of stuff in here I can't talk about but this is basically the heart of our units that have these coffins inside of them. The Everest, the Denali, Typhon. So is it potted with epoxy? Is yes. that for vibration or protecting intellectual property? Everything. It, it does two things. Uh, so Chris worked with 3M to develop this material. It, it had two requirements. First, it can't be chipped off or broken. Second, it can be put in an oven and melted and removed. Those are the two common ways to defeat um, potting compounds. So this material, you can actually hit it with a sledgehammer as hard as you can swing the sledgehammer and it will not shatter, will not break. 
and we can heat it to 1100 degrees Fahrenheit and it won't flow and it, and it won't and, and you can't get anything out of it. Second, you can't cut it. Chris uses a uh, carbide titanium drills and we can demonstrate it where you try to drill through the material and it will destroy the drill. Mm. So A, we have had a lot of problems with quote reverse engineering. So it defeats that. <clears throat> and second is um, vibration components. We, we s spent a lot of time dealing with handling vibration in these products. And what I found is that instead of trying to use something to absorb vibration, it's actually superior to make all of the components that move relative to one another, you make them as a monolithic block where the transmission speed of vibration moves through it extremely quickly. So there's no storage of uh, energy and release of energy relative one component to the other one. And so this gives you superior vibration performance. It's, it's more immune to vibration than something where you might have a coil and a wire and they can slightly vibrate and it will modulate the signals relative to one another. Uh, you just launched a, an entirely new product category in the Altera grounding system. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you talk a little bit about what led to the, the, the idea to make a grounding system and, and how long you've been thinking about it and <laughs> how it's implemented in this new hardware? Okay, I think we just need to back up and say, well, why does grounding work at all? Uh, what does it do objectively? And there's two things. Number one, uh, that people don't understand is that uh, you can take a voltmeter and you can measure the voltage on a chassis of a specific component and you may find compared to an earth ground there may actually be a voltage on that chassis. And, uh, you would think there isn't one, but there may be several millivolts, and this is a, the result technically of leakage currents or induced currents from large transformers. So you can actually have both DC and AC voltages on chassis. Now the interesting part is, is that you can have a voltage on one chassis and a different chassis in the same system can have a different voltage. Now when you connect those two together with an interconnect, the interconnect has a ground wire, and so it's connecting the chassis ground of one component to the chassis ground of another component, and you now get, because you have a voltage difference, you now get currents through that interconnect. Ground loop. A ground loop, what we call a ground loop. So it could be a DC current, which is bad, but very common it's an AC low frequency component if it's coming from the transformers or the power supply, and we hear this as hum, but there's a, a second more pernicious form which is high frequency. You do not hear it as a hum and so when you hook it up you don't go, oh damn, I've, I've got a ground loop because you don't hear anything. Mm -hmm. But what happens is you're modulating the ground planes of both power supplies and that modulates the signal because in the amplification mm -hmm. circuit you have an internal amplifier and it amplifies in reference to the signal ground. And so if the signal ground is moving relative... Oh, the, the whole audio signal is moving right along with it. Right. And, and, and this is one of the other misconceptions that many audiophiles have, is they'll say, oh, I don't have noise in my system. And they will say, um, I, I, don't, I, I have my system on and the volumes at the normal listening level and I'm not playing anything and I put my ear up to the speaker and I don't hear anything. I don't have noise. Mm. I said, well, that's not true. Mm. You don't have noise when you're not running a signal through there. Mm. But as soon as you run a, an amplified signal through there, the noise is not sitting down here somewhere. It's not in space. Noise doesn't sit down here and then I've got my signal up here all pure and pristine. Mm. And if the signal gets low enough down here, I will hear it. That's not how it works. The noise actually rides 
the signal. It's part, it's it's part, part of, the, of signal. the signal. It's embedded right. in it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's integrated. It's not a separate thing that sits there. That's absolutely yeah. right. And so that's a concept I would really like people to understand better. Um, so, so you can think of it as a parasitic way of removing noise, even though it's technically not a filter, as mm. you would have, you would think of it like a signal where I'm passing it through an inductor and a capacitor. There is no signal transfer with grounds. Supposedly there shouldn't be current flow through there, but the noise exists mm. on the chassis and the ground wires. Mm. So sometimes people will say, well, why should we buy your grounding product? And I will say, well, uh, you probably shouldn't if you're not even doing basic grounding. You should do that first because that's almost free mm. and you're going to get a very significant performance benefit. And if people will take the time to actually do that, then they will understand that grounding is important and it, it's very much now in our modern mm. times forgotten or overlooked. One of the most important aspects that we do in the production, and that's our K-PIP. So over here, I have multiple K-PIP stations. And so I've got three different racks that are K-PIP. So over there, I'll get on that far one, that's all my power cable. So I'll, I'll K-PIP every power cable that gets built, assembled here, goes through a K-PIP process. That K-PIP process is well, it, it depends on what it is, but it runs multiple days we, uh, for each individual product. This middle station here is where all the signal cables will get K-PIP. Um, and so, uh, I'll, I'll bring you over here in a minute but, and just kind of show you the process. And, and that's kinetic phase inversion process. Maybe you can explain a little bit what that is. Maybe you can. <laughs> <laughs> Squirrel. Go ahead. <laughs> you can explain it. We'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Well, and then this one, this rack here, is all my power conditioners. And so again, every single every single product that we build will go through the K pit process. And so not only will it go through the K pit process at its finished stage, but we also K pit raw wire. So all the raw wire that we manu that we build our products out of will go through a K pit every process. Every wire that comes every in, single no matter piece what of the wire, product no matter is. what the product is. And it'll get K-PIP at the start, and then it'll go through its final K-PIP at the finish. And so what we do here is, like I said, so we built every single one, hand-built every single one of these adapters so that we can run multiple K-PIP as we jump them. And you can see this run at Everest. Every outlet, every receptacle gets K-PIP individually. So, and so our device is fed through there, K-PIP, and then we jump her at each one. And normally these racks are full, but we run, so as soon as they're empty and they've run their process, they go back to the shipping department to get packaged and to ship. They got a run of power cables here that are going through a K-PIP process. And so each level is a different phase of the K-PIP process. As we're developing a product, we will then brainstorm in the office. We'll go through all the series of stages that it goes through, but we also 3D print a lot of our parts before we before we either if they're going to plastic or anything like that so we will 3d print each part to make sure that it fits before we go into full production with it Chris are these timers then that are counting down what processes so there uh, so these are there's a timer in here but these are also oh, amps that are running through okay. it correct right. if we turn this up too high we can actually melt the dielectric right right off of the right off of the unit so chris has to be very careful when he adjusts the k-pip unit to make sure it's in that ideal range you can set it where it starts to go into a thermal runaway so the heat will start to build and build and build over time so uh, each one of the things they k-pip has uh, specific settings to make sure that we don't overheat it or damage it so is it continuous or is it pulsed or? Uh, and or that's what it, we don't talk about. That, that's, the, that's the part we don't talk that's about. That's the secret sauce. Yeah, yeah, right. We, we use two different terms. We use burn-in and settling time. So burn-in is a process where at the molecular structure, the metals are being modified or moved. The relationship of the molecular structures as you run current through there, you know that a metal 
is an amorphous material and also simultaneously a crystalline material. So the orientation of the molecules shifts as you move current through it over time. That's why it takes time for the burn-in process because it moves, but it moves slowly. And then there's conditioning of the dielectrics, you know, that people have talked about. For most products, we do at least four days of KPIP. But that doesn't mean that once you put it in your system that it doesn't shift. It does, and we call that settling time because you're, you're running different levels of current and different signals through the cable than we run through it. And the cable always settles to your specific system and the signals that you're running through it. So that's kind of the final stage of quote burn-in. I call it settling time because the major things that are shifting of the metallurgy and the dielectrics have all been done by KPIP. So when you put, like when you take a cable out of a system and you put it on the floor, you bend it, you know that when you put it back, it usually takes anywhere from an hour to maybe a day for it to come back to its settled mm -hmm. state. So that's what I call settling. Mm -hmm. So when you get something new from us, it will take a day to two days. You'll even notice it with the ground cables. Mm -hmm. you, even though they're K-pipped, you'll, you'll, and, and they don't technically have current running through them, but, but they will shift o over a period of a couple of days. We would build identical cables and we'd have one that got no K-pip and then one day, two days, three days, um, four days, eight days. And that's how we came up with that the 80% point is four days. And that's reasonable from a production point of view. You see, we make hundreds to thousands of products a month. And so realistically, we can't put them in a system for weeks at a time to burn them in. But four days is reasonable. We can do that. And then on products like an Everest or, or a top premium product, we'll K-PIP them for eight days. Mm. So we have certain uh, uh, other manufacturers that use our wiring in their components. And we will actually K-PIP the entire spools of wire for those, and those are usually done at eight days. The Altera is a little different than other grounding products in that each one, there's six terminals on the back, and each one of those terminals is individually pulling noise from the component that it's connected to. So it's not just like a big vat or a tank where you're running ground wires to it and that big vat is absorbing noise. Actually, each one of those connections mm -hmm. is individually removing noise from that specific mm -hmm. component. Mm -hmm. And so when you multiply that over multiple components, this component generates noise and the Altera is reducing it. The DAC has noise in the chassis and it's removing it on this channel. So the cumulative effect is additive. Mm. And so the Altera is exceptional in that regard. And secondarily, we actually make two versions of mm. an Altera. One is specifically designed to remove chassis ground noise, and the second one is designed to remove signal ground noise. And it's very important mm. that those two be treated differently. So to go back to my original uh, thoughts on why I didn't want to do a grounding system was because they were tweaky and you get variable results. What I found in my research is the reason was is that people did not understand well the difference between chassis and earth ground and signal ground. And that certain equipment you could chassis ground effectively, but other equipment you necessarily need to signal ground it. Mm. And it was the mixing of the two that caused the variable mm. result. And so that's why in the Altera, there are actually two models. And if you follow our user guide and our grounding concepts, we explain very clearly how to determine which method you need to use for mm -hmm. each component. See, what's interesting about these is they actually capture the cable. So they're not just sitting on there, they're capturing the vibration that runs over the surface of the cable. These three straps are supporting it, and now watch as it wraps around the cable and captures it. 
So you can turn it at any angle and it still has the cable captured. And you know the annoying thing with cable elevators is if you touch anything, they, they all off. fall off. Yeah. See this, this actually suspends and holds the cable. You can disconnect the cable and leave these attached. And of course, we can't get rid of the door, but with this oh. panel system, oh, wow. when we go into listening mode, I can simply move the pen. I love music. Uh, I've been a music guy my whole life. Uh, probably all-time favorite artist would be J. Cole. Joni Mitchell Blue is a front-to-back banger. Uh, master of Puppets. Favorite, all-time favorite song is Into the Mystic by Van Morrison. Uh, yeah, that's a balance between the Mars Volta and Tool, I guess. All right, well, thanks for that uh, informative yeah. discussion. Thanks. Brother. Thanks. Perhaps expensive, halibut's expensive. To be able to share with my Shinyana family, with my family, is a blessing. Oh, he has his days, man. <laughs> I'll be honest. He has that's... some nice cables here. I would recommend buying them. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Crazy good. Yeah. Thank you. Love yeah. Magic's right there. If you ever want to know magic, that's magic. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs>